Hello everybody. It takes two to tango. So I'm going to talk about the ultimate twosome, nukes and climate change in 2024, which is the title of an article that just came out um, January 4, 2024 by um, Tom Engelhart. And uh, it's basically known as Tom's Dispatch. Um, I remember reading it a while ago and I haven't uh, read any of his stuff recently, but this is a very interesting article because I wanted to talk about nuclear weapons and the nuclear threat in the context of abrupt climate system change. So this is an excellent article with really good links. Uh, you can just Google it. So uh, basically, um, I really like his writing and what he says. So honestly, what strange creatures we are. Nothing stops us when it comes to destruction. And I'm not even thinking about the devastation of Gaza or Ukraine. I mean, give us credit as the new year begins. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about humanity isn't our literature, our theater, our movies, the remarkable food we cook, the cities we've built, or the endless other things we've created. To my mind, it's the fact that in a relatively brief time as rulers of this planet, amid a chaos of never-ending wars and conflicts, we've come up with not just one, but two different ways of doing ourselves and much of the rest of the world in. That's no small achievement. So go back a couple centuries, even amid humanity's wars and other conflicts, someone suggesting that a possible future would undoubtedly have been laughed out of the room. It took science fiction, H.G. Wells imagining the arrival of murderous Martians to begin to conceive of such all too modern, all too apocalyptic world ending possibilities. And that reference to, you know, War of the Worlds, most people have heard of the, the screenplay that was done. Um, uh, but the author was H.G. Wells, um, and the original classic War of the Worlds was an 1898 um, paperback, an 1898 book. It never was a war, any more than there's war between man and ants, right? So what he's saying is that basically, you know, it's called War of the Worlds, but it's, it's not a war, it's just, it's one-sided. You know, the aliens have the incredible powers they can just wipe out humanity. And this is why one of the reasons I object to the term Israeli-Gaza war, it's not a war at all, it's just a massacre of one side by the other side. So this book, uh, the original 1898 classic, Humans versus Martians, conventional ballistics versus the dreaded heat ray and poisonous black smoke. It's not the survival of one person at stake, it's the survival of all of humanity. Okay, so the War of the Worlds takes you into late 19th century England when a full-scale Martian invasion has begun. I'll have to reread this. <laughs> okay, so that's the idea. You know, people started thinking, okay, you know, there, there could be some factor or something that can destroy the world. And it was, you know, given that power was given to the, the Martians you know, back at the turn of the century, turn of the previous century. But now you don't need fiction at all. And this is interesting because Cli-Fi, I did a video on climate fiction. Um, in fact, I did some work um, editing uh, Dark Heat by the author Tom Riley, and I did a whole separate video on that a week or so ago. Um, so, you know, climate fiction, I'll do further videos on climate fiction because it's interesting. You know, it imagines a dystopian future in the near term future. But, you know, things are moving so fast with abrupt climate system mayhem that it's hard for the fiction authors to to get stuff out there before it actually happens on our planet, before a catastrophe happens. Right. So, you know, there's nothing glacially slow about um abrupt climate change. In fact, you can't even use the term glacially slow because the glaciers are going like crazy. Um, so in its wisdom, in quotation marks, humanity has managed to come up with two different ways of utterly destroying this planet as a living habitat. 
The first, of course, is atomic weapons, nuclear weapons. I don't know if you got to see Oppenheimer, but it's an excellent historical look in movie format, big screen movie format of the development of the first atomic bomb by Oppenheimer in the New Mexican desert, um, the Manhattan Project, their first detonation test, July 1945, and then they dropped it a few months later on Hiroshima and Nagasaki with devastating effect. But the, um, you know, in its two times in use, atomic weapons lit up the skies in a blinding fashion, destroying much of those two Japanese cities, slaughtering hundreds of thousands of human beings, both in the moment and in the years that followed from the long-term effects of radiation. These two bombs uh, were called Little Boy and Fat Man. They were used on August 6th and 9th, 1945. Today, they'd be considered the most modest of tactical or low-yield nuclear weapons. The major weapons in the American and Russian arsenals are, of course, hydrogen bombs that are blindingly more powerful. The warheads on just one U.S. nuclear-armed submarine has seven times the destructive power of all the bombs dropped on World War II, including the two atomic bombs dropped on Japan. And the U.S. usually has 10 of these submarines at sea. Okay, so while in 1945 only the U.S. had such weapons, there's, you know, that's, that changed very quickly. Today, nine countries have nuclear arsenals, and there are at present nearly 13,000 nuclear weapons on the planet. Okay, um, and the major nuclear powers, the U.S. and Russia, are both in the process of modernizing their arsenals. They're very, the U.S. is being very quiet about it. China is visibly rushing to catch up. The U.S. is expected to put up to $2 trillion into updating its supply of nukes over the next uh, few decades. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the things uh, here. Okay, so how have nuclear weapons evolved since Oppenheimer and the Trinity test? This is by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, came out not too long ago. So it took the Manhattan Project three years to develop a nuclear bomb. Almost 80 years later, how have nuclear weapons evolved? And again, if you haven't seen the movie Oppenheimer uh, or Barbenheimer, Barbie and Oppenheimer, you got to watch those those movies. They came out at the same time. I like the term Barbenheimer. Okay, so the first bomb dropped in World War II. Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Three days later, the U.S. dropped the second bomb, Fat Man, on Nagasaki. The, the two bombs had yields of 15 kilotons and 21 kilotons. Okay, a kiloton being a, uh, a thousand tons um, of TNT equivalent, 100,000 lives lost. Then they, of course, after the war, did a lot of atmospheric nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands and Nevada. Um, and other countries developed their, their weapons. So since the first development of weapons, the total number of nuclear tests uh, exceeds 2,000, with 528 tests conducted above ground. These open-air tests, you know, uh, we all have remnants of this radiation in, our, in things like our teeth and our bones, anybody living on the planet today. You know, it was one of the ideas for calling this uh, era the Anthropocene, the nuclear testing. These above ground tests had a destructive force of more than 400,000 kilotons of TNT. Okay, so there's a history here of the testing, the Manhattan Project, the first bombs developed and dropped, Great Britain testing, Russia testing, China testing, non-proliferation treaties, intermediate range nuclear forces treaties, and then of course the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver these bombs on the other side of the world. Okay, so that's the timeline. The, long, the biggest bomb is, of course, a hydrogen bomb. You can use a um, nuclear bomb, atomic bomb, to detonate a hydrogen bomb. 
Hydrogen bombs are fusion reactions much more powerful than the fission reactions from the atomic bombs. Um, the largest nuclear weapon to ever be tested, Tsar Bomba, there's a whole Wikipedia page, you can have a look at it. It had an estimated yield of 50 megatons. Although it had a capacity double that, an explosive yield greater than that of the little boy by a factor of 3,500. So 3,500 more times powerful than the first uh, 15 kilo kiloton, um, uh, 50, 15 kiloton um, uh, little boy or 21 kiloton fat man. Okay, it's the Tsar Bomba means king of bombs. It's a monster H-bomb designed by the Soviet Union. It generated a fireball that reached a diameter of four kilometers, mushroom cloud that rose 60 kilometers, the blast wave felt a thousand kilometers away, the shock wave detected 4,000 kilometers away. Um, if the same bomb dropped on Hiroshima was detonated in a major U.S. city like New York City today, you'd have 264,000 lives lost, 512,000 injuries. Sarbamba would kill 7.6 million people, injuring an additional 4.2 million. So he's, here's some of the stats. You know, this is a little boy, the Hiroshima bomb, 15 kiloton, you know, an airburst over New York, what it would look like with the fireball, 180 meters, blast damage, 339 meters, radiation, 1.2 kilometers, and so on, fatalities. This is a Sarbamba, 50 megaton airburst. You know, it would just be devastating. It would kill millions and millions of people. Okay, um, these bombs are too large to be considered operational though. Like Sarbamba weighed 27 tons, was the size of eight meters long by two meters diameter, making it impractical to be deployed in a ballistic missile. So nuclear states have gone to smaller, lighter, faster. Um, they've developed uh, miniaturization and uh, come up with these tactical nuclear weapons, ranging from a kiloton to above 100 kiloton, right? So keep to keep this in context, little boy was 15 kiloton, fat man hitting, kill, uh, hitting Nagasaki was 21 kiloton. So these are, you know, in that sort of range, they're lower yield, very small size, like suitcase size in some cases um, for battlefield use. Okay, and uh, you could almost deploy them in drones, in fact, if they're suitcase size, right? So it's cra crazy stuff. So there's been treaties, you know, this is the arms control and nuclear warheads over time. This is a number of warheads okay so zero starting up this is the u.s number and this is the russia so russia just went right up it reached a peak you know right here what what's that uh eight, 1980 uh this is two years 82 84 86 there you go boom no surprise that the inf treaty came along right otherwise this curve would have gone way up and it started going down there were various treaties, START, you know, um, START II, Strategic Offense Reductions Treaties, a new START, and here we are today. U.S. 4,477 nuke, H-bombs, or nuclear weapons, Russia 3,708. Okay, uh, we reached uh, MAD, Mutually Assured uh, Destruction, basically. Um, Okay, so this is how the U.S. arsenal and Russian arsenals look like over time. Um, Edward Teller is known as the father of the H-bomb, a Hungarian physicist, um, and uh, born 1908, died 2003. I was fortunate enough, or maybe I should say unfortunate enough, to hear a talk by him uh, when I went to California and started working for Rockwell uh, around 2000. 
and uh, you know, he came to the Rockwell Science Center and gave a talk, and there was a whole bunch of protests and hippies and so on and so forth. But anyway, I got to meet him, known as the father of the H-bomb. And, um, you know, he did lots of work on material physics, quantum mechanics, and, you know, he started up basically Los Alamos, uh, was one of the founders. Um, you know, he left Germany uh, in 1926, partly due to the discrimination, um, right? So the political climate and revolutions in Hungary made him, ha you know, hate communism and fascism. Luckily for us, you know, he left and joined the good guys, so-called good guys, right? The West. Um, lots of information about him. You know, he plays a role in the... Um, you know, he, he's in, he, in 1942, he became part of Robert Oppenheimer's summer planning session, you know, on the Manhattan Project. So he's played by, you know, you see him in um, Oppenheimer and he talks about hydrogen fusion actually in the movie. So his, his idea was that the fusion weapon, which he called the super, um, you know, he basically is the father of, of the H-bomb. So there's a lot of you know, I like the way that they portray things in Oppenheimer. Um, and he really pushed for the importance of nuclear weapons to keep peace in the world and so on. Um, right? As, uh, you know, peace by power, I guess. Um, he, he basically, he never regretted any of his work. He never, he thought that it was important that the atomic bombs were dropped uh, to end World War II, thinks that they ended World War II. Um, and, uh, you know, very controversial figure and uh, actually talked about climate change. Teller was one of the first prominent people to raise the danger of climate change, driven by the burning of fossil fuels. In December 1957, he gave a talk to the membership of the American Chemical Society. He warned that the large amount of carbon-based fuel that had been burnt was increasing the concentration of CO2, which would act in the same way as a greenhouse, which would raise the temperature of the surface. He calculated that if the concentration in the atmosphere increased by 10%, an appreciable part of the polar ice might melt. This is back in 1957. In 1959, at an American Petroleum Institute uh, symposium, you know, American oil industry, he said, I am to talk to you about the energy in the future. I start by telling you that I believe that the energy resources of the past must be supplemented. And this, strangely, is the question of contaminating the atmosphere. He talked about carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide having a strange property, transmitting visible light but absorbing the infrared, which is emitted from the earth, causing the greenhouse effect. He said that a temperature rise corresponding to a 10% increase in CO2 could melt the ice cap and submerge New York. All the coastal cities would be covered by water, and since the considerable percentage of the human race lives in coastal regions, he thinks this chemical contamination of the atmosphere with CO2 is more serious than most people tend to believe. There you go, interesting. Um, he was one of the strongest and best known advocates for investigating non-military uses of nuclear explosions. So the US called this Operation Plowshare. So one of the most controversial projects was to use a multi-megaton hydrogen bomb exploding a whole bunch of hydrogen bombs. This is off Alaska. This is a Chuck Key Sea to create a deep water harbor more than a mile long and half a mile wide to use for shipment of resources from coal and oil fields through Port Hope, Alaska. They looked at this pro proposal seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, the, they, they studied it, the heck out of it. They abandoned the project in 1962, okay, due to financial infeasibility, radiation health issues. Um, it would only be ice, it would be ice bound for nine months of the year. It wouldn't be a practical harbor being only open for three months of the year. 
He also had a plan to extract oil from the tar sands in Al northern Alberta with nuclear explosions, Project Oil Sands. This is interesting. This is a new one to me, or I, I think I'd just forgotten about it. The Alberta government endorsed this, but Diefenbaker, Government of Canada, he rejected this because he was opposed to having any nuclear weapons in Canada. After he was out of office, Canada went on to have nuclear weapons from a new uh, U.S. nuclear sharing agreement from 1963 to 1984. Most people don't realize this history. He also proposed the use of nuclear bombs to prevent damage from powerful hurricanes. Exploding a nuke in the right time as a hurricane was being formed, you could break it up with um, the heat generated and you'd have several small hurricanes rather than one big one. He advised uh, Israeli on nuclear matters and the building of a hydrogen bomb. So a lot of the Israeli's nuclear bomb programs, Teller was directly connected. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, um, <laughs> this is interesting. He had a heart attack in 1979, blamed it on Jane Fonda, who had starred in the China Syndrome which depicted a fictional reactor accident and it was released less than two weeks before the Three Mile Island accident. Get a load of that. The movie came out just... <laughs> so conspiracy theories would have, have a go at this, right? The movie, The China Syndrome, comes out two weeks later, Three Mile Island happens. Uh, Star Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative... Um, asteroid impact avoidance and so on. So, yeah, so I basically saw him give his talk about uh, 2000, just about two or three years before he passed away. So, you know, quite quite a character. Well worth reading his uh, Wikipedia page. These are the countries uh, that have nuclear weapons, 12,512 warheads in the world, um, you know, Here's the numbers from the nuclear nations, uh, the nine. Yeah, there's nine listed on there. Six nations hosting nuclear weapons. Okay. Um, okay, so they haven't uh, developed them themselves, but they're, they're hosting them. I didn't realize this. Italy, Turkey, Belgium, Germany. Germany's, yeah, not surprised there. Netherlands, uh, Belarus. Okay, uh, tactical nuclear weapons or the battlefield ones. Um, there's the new nine nuclear armed states, five states hosting nuclear weapons, 29 other nuclear endorsers. Okay, so still very much a, a issue. Now, this is an article here. Um, I read that basically five, only five nuclear explosions could trigger a nuclear winter, it could change the climate. So let's, uh, I'll get back to the article, uh, but let's have a, a look at some of these things here. So only five nuclear explosions are enough to change the climate and trigger a nuclear autumn or nuclear winter. In the case of China's five megaton bomb, a single throw is enough to destabilize the planet's climate. So let's have a look at that. The anxiety of nuclear annihilation was a specter that loomed over the Cold War. Things seem to be a lot calmer nowadays. This article was from 2019. Um, there's still, you know, 17,000 intact nuclear warheads around the world. 7,000 of these are awaiting dismantlement. Still over 10,000 Armageddon-causing bombs. Okay, um, and, uh, you know, it talks about MAD. Um, MAD, as opposed to MADD, is Mutually Assured Destruction. MADD is Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Okay, so Mutually Assured dirt Destruction, right? One side, you know, attacks the other side and they're going to get decimated. Um, all-out nuclear war, producing an all-out nuclear, uh, a nuclear winter, which can block the sun and cause crop failures around the, the year a world for multiple years, okay? It's, um, you know, mass famine around the world would result. 
More people might die in non-combatant countries than those where the bombs exploded because of this effect. Even a nuclear war between India and Pakistan, two neighboring countries who view, which view each other as nemesis, could produce so much smoke that it would produce global environmental change unprecedented in recorded human history. Okay, so... Um, the U.S., Russia, and China all have weapons that could trigger a nuclear autumn by detonating no more than five bonds. So, bombs. So a nuclear autumn is not as severe as a nuclear winter. Um, okay, so this is, uh, and there's been a lot of research on this. You know, you, you can use global climate models to see what you could expect, you know, if all of this ash and soot was put into the atmosphere. Let me... Um, let me just close some of the windows I've talked about here. Do well, actually, I'll do that later. I want to take some figures from it to use for Twitter posts, etc. Okay, so I covered this article. You don't need a lot of nukes to cause a nuclear autumn, or even worse, worse a nuclear winter. This is a study from Rutgers, um, and it's fairly recent study. Um, I don't see the date offhand. Nuclear war could cause a global famine and kill billions, Rutger-led study finds. More than 5 billion people would die of hunger following a full-scale nuclear war between the U.S. and Russia. There you go. There's 8 billion of us on the planet. It would take out, what, 60% of humans on the planet would die of hunger. Wouldn't be enough food. This was a global study led by Rutger's climate scientists that estimates post-conflict crop production. Okay, so I'll, I should maybe talk about this global study separately in a separate video. I just wanted to bring it up. Um, the data tells us one thing. We must prevent a nuclear war from ever happening, says Alan Roebuck, a distinguished professor um, at Rutgers, co-author of the study. Uh, it was published in the journal Nature food. So they used a community or system model. They uh, looked at detonations of nuclear weapons and even the smallest, under the smallest nuclear scenario, a localized war between India and Pakistan, global average caloric production decreased 7% within five years of the conflict. In the largest war scenario tested, a full-scale U.S.-Russia nuclear conflict, global average caloric production decreased by about 90% three to four years after the fighting. Crop declines would be the most severe in the mid-high latitude nations, including major exporting countries like Russia and the U.S., of course Canada. There would be catastrophic disruption of global food markets. Um, and uh, yeah, it would just be horrendous. So here's some plots here. This is calorie intake. Um, and this is... Um, nuclear weapon scenarios, like how many teragrams um, and, uh, you know, or gigatons, right? Teragram gigatons, caloric intake in 2011, you know, and what it would be 1911, you start losing weight, 1145, less than resting energy expenditure, global production as a percentage population with food support. And you can see the reduction um, from different uh, nuclear war scenarios. Okay, uh, so huge starvation of, we're talking of, you know, billions of people. Population in danger, billion, uh, you, you know, um, population with, with, with food support, like, like billions of people. We're talking about 5 billion people dying of starvation in the worst nuclear exchange, you know, tw an 80% drop of food. Okay, so that's a very sobering study. Um, and as far as Earth's climate, this is from August of last year. Analysis, nuclear war would be more devastating for Earth's climate than Cold War predictions. This is Professor Mark Maslin. Um, he, he, he had an article in the Con Conversation, which is an Australian online uh, publication. The resulting nuclear winter could plunge the planet into a nuclear 
little ice age lasting thousands of years. It might take thousands of years to for the planet to recover from a nuclear winter, should a nuclear winter happen. So, you know, a nuclear war would basically, you know, you think, well, I don't live in the US or Russia. If it broke out, I'd be okay. Well, no, no, you're gonna starve to death probably. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna be in a nuclear ice little ice age that could last thousands of years. The planet will be totally different. Okay, so they talk about this came out because of Christopher Nolan's biopic uh, Oppenheimer. It's revived morbid curiosity and the destructive power of nuclear weapons because people forget over time. There's an estimated twelve and a half thousand nuclear warheads. A war in which even a fraction of these bombs were detonated would create blast waves and fires capable of killing millions of people instantly. The radiation-induced cancers and genetic damage would affect the remaining population for generations. But, you know, the Earth's climate will go to hell and we won't be able to grow food. So this was first discussed using the knowledge of chemistry and climate modeling by atmospheric scientists Paul Kreutzen and John Burks. They wrote a short paper in 1982 suggesting a nuclear war would produce a smoke cloud so massive that it would cause what would become known as nuclear winter. This, they claimed, would devastate agriculture and with it civilization. Now, this was a key paper coming out in the middle of the Cold War because it told the policymakers in Russia and the U.S. that, you know, don't even think of, of a limited uh, nuclear exchange because you're going to take out the food supply of the planet, you know, which we didn't know before. So this was a key and crucial paper, you know, and it was the climate modeling that did it. But with modern climate models, they're more sophisticated than they used back then. Right. So they're saying that the work 40 years ago was an underestimate. Environmental scientists led by Alan Robach, Robach at Rutgers, he said in a recent paper that the nuclear winter theory helped end the proliferation of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. In 1986, President Reagan and Gorbachev took the first steps in history to reduce the number of nuclear weapons while citing the predicted consequences of a nuclear winter for all life on Earth. Okay, so I showed you, um, I showed you this right this was 1986 right they realized that nuclear winter would take out civilization so they had this inf treaty negotiation and started the the drawdown okay so that was crucial information in the paper in 1982. okay because at the height of the arms race in the mid 80s there were over 65,000 nuclear weapons the reduction in the global nuclear arsenal to just over 12,000, of which 4,000 are on operational standby, like, for example, sitting in a nuclear sub, being able to launch with the push of a couple buttons and turn of a couple keys. Also in missile silos, the ICBMs also in uh, to be loaded onto planes as well. The triad of nuclear defense, submarines, ground based and uh, aircraft, large aircraft. Okay, so with the largest possible nuclear exchange between the U.S. and Russia, new models suggest the ocean would cool so profoundly that the world would be thrust into a nuclear little ice age lasting thousands of years. Okay, so <laughs> scientists, it's even more urgent now for scientists to study the consequences of detonating nuclear weapons and to ensure as many people as possible know about them. Okay, the threat of nuclear war has not gone away and a nuclear ice age, which would do much of life on Earth for millennia, for thousands of years, is still a possibility. And of course, you know, the Ukraine, war in Ukraine has brought old fears to the surface with Putin threatening a limited use of nuclear weapons. A single launch could escalate into a regional war and even global exchange that would plunge billions of people into a world so harrowing that we can barely comprehend it. Right? Killing, what, five billion people? <laughs> okay. Right? No small potatoes, this stuff. And, um, you know, how war impacts climate change in the environment, even in a non-nuclear fashion, is mentioned 
um, you know, in lots of different articles. So this is one from October of 2022, and it was talking about the Ukraine-Russian war, warfare releasing greenhouse gas emissions and so on. Okay, so let's go back um, to, let's go back to this article here. Okay, so a nuclear little ice age. This is Tom, the Tom Dispatch article, right? So North Korea, of course, has just joined the, the nine or they tested their first ICBM. This 2023 ended. Um, the nuclear agreements that existed between the great powers are now largely extinct. Both major and minor nuclear powers are working hard to build up and modernize their nuclear arsenals in the, into the distant future. The ability to destroy most life on the planet remains mind-numbingly present. And because we've never experienced anything like it, it's all too hard to grasp. Okay, uh, and then he talks about the nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, putting in, us in a global nuclear winter. And a large-scale conflict could lead to a nuclear little ice age that could last thousands of years. Okay, so in the last 78 years, since the first nukes were destroying cities, um, you know, we haven't used them. Okay, so hopefully that keeps up. There's a book called The Fate of the Earth, written in 1982. Um, and Jonathan Shell, he says, since we have not made a positive decision to exterminate ourselves, but instead have chosen to live on the edge of extinction, periodically lunging toward the abyss only to draw back at the last second, our situation is one of uncertainty and nervous insecurity rather than absolute hopelessness. Okay, and, uh, you know, the present conflicts, this, this Russian official, Dmitry Medvedev, he was fearing a coming Ukrainian counteroffensive. He said, just imagine that the offensive in tandem with NATO succeeded and ended up with part of our land being taken away. Then we would have to use nuclear weapons by virtue of the stipulations of the Russian presidential decree. There wouldn't be any other solutions. Our enemies should pray to our fighters that they do not allow the world to go up in nuclear flames. <laughs> there, there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, cra crazy, uh, crazy stuff. And, you know, um, Musk um, and his Starlink, you know, is what the drones use for guidance. And apparently the Ukrainians were going to have a massive attack on Russian ships. And with the with uh, submarine uh, type drones, and apparently Musk didn't provide the uh, Starlink coverage because he worried that loads of ships would be sunk in a very successful attack, and that could trigger a nuclear weapon response from Russia. So he thought he was doing a good thing, saving the world. Okay, well, it's not just nuclear, right? Right, we humans have a second way to turn the world into a burning ember. And Shell actually noted that in his 1982 book, again, The Fate of the Earth. He said, um, nuclear explosions are far from being the only perturbations in question. A heating of the global atmosphere through an increased greenhouse effect, which could be caused by the injection of vast amounts of CO2 in the air, for instance, from the increased burning of coal, is another notable peril of this kind. And this was in 1982, fate of the earth. So yeah, um, the weather bomb, right? <laughs> A creation of the industrial revolution, 1.5 Celsius, you know, last year. We had days, our first and second day of two degrees Celsius um, above pre-industrial. Global average temperature of 1.75 above pre-industrial. So you know, the, the record acceleration of climate change, the increase of billion dollar climate disasters, all of this stuff is getting worse at exponential rate. Um, unbelievable 55 days at 110 degrees or above for Phoenix, Arizona. You know, worse yet, in the wake of the COP28 global climate meeting in the petro heart of the Middle East, Delegates couldn't agree on a goal of phasing out or even phasing down fossil fuel usage, but only on transitioning away from it. 
uh, you know, meanwhile, the U.S. is the planet's largest oil and natural gas producer, set for another, it set another record year in 2023. Um, they're rubber stamping all of the fossil fuel expansion. You know, it's only going to get worse with Trump. That's even with Biden. You know, Trump's saying that we're going to drill, 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 drill on his first day as dictator in the Oval Office in 2025, should he win. A striking number of Americans voting for him refuse to even believe that the obvious is happening to us, right? And they're climate change deniers. And of course, if Trump won, it would put him in charge of nuclear, America's nuclear arsenal, which I've been talking about. So the blistering and the boiling of the planet and the quick rise is going to really uh, affect global food supplies and so on. So anyway, this is a very good article. Um, this sort of thing should be the story of our times. We're talking about the end of the world as we've known it, and that should be, but isn't the news of our time or of any time. Welcome to 2024. Okay, so this is a very, uh, you know, it, it's it's an excellent article. I guess I'll have to be adding Tom's Dispatch to my regular reading. It's the ultimate twosome, nukes and climate change, 2024. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll chat soon. Oh, by the way, uh, yes, please go to my website, paulbeckwith.net and donate to PayPal to support my research and videos. Thanks again. And bye for now.